My next guest is the legendary voice of rock and voice of Deep Purple, Ian Gillen. Thank Very you. well. Good morning, Ian. It oh, must be afternoon. early. Good afternoon for me. I think it's early in the morning for you, isn't it? Uh, not too bad. I've been up since six o'clock, so <laughs> it's, uh, I like to get started. Nice. Early. Nice. Is it, is it good weather in uh, Portugal? Yeah, it's fantastic. We've gone into the summer now. I don't expect to see any rain for three months, and uh, it's a nice 28, 33 degrees. Beautiful. Between them. You, have which, you is I like to get, which is why I like to get started early in the morning, because uh, it's too hot in the afternoon to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But have you lived there for a while in Portugal? I don't live here. It's my... Okay. I, I live in England, but I spend a lot of time here. I've got a studio here and a, a house where family comes for holidays. I've been coming to Portugal for over 20 years. Nice. Um, and I bought a place here about 12 years ago, mm -hmm. just because my manager was complaining about how much money I was spending renting property for holidays. So I've actually yeah. saved money over 12 years. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, it seems like a great place to live. I've never been, but I've read and you know, I've uh, got I friends who visit. It. Yeah. Yes, it's it, it's it's very easy culturally um, to fit in here. People are very warm and welcoming. And um, I think that it's good for English people to come here because Portugal is the only country in Europe with whom we've not been at war ever. <laughs> <laughs> so we must have something in common. Yeah, we, we have actually, we have quite a history with Portugal, right? There's a Goa and Portugal yeah. connection. Yes, indeed. So we have quite a history with uh, Portugal as well. As well. Well, but Portugal thank you. Quite Sorry. an adventurous nation over the, in the, in the, a few centuries ago, Portugal was quite an adventurous nation. It was one of yeah. the, uh, just lots of explorers and expeditions and that sort of thing. Yeah. <clears throat> But does it have a very, uh, like a vibrant music scene as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot of um, the bands everywhere. But mind you, there are bands everywhere, everywhere yeah. in the world now. Um, it seems to be there are more, um, more bands. We were joking the other day about there were so many bands now that it was kind of getting boring and that we were going to perhaps go and watch some plumbers or something like that for a bit of excitement. <laughs> And we can see a plumbers convention at Wembley Stadium being uh, attended by <laughs> 60,000 people. Oh, he's going to do a bend. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Look, he's doing scene. Anyway, I, I'm in my usual stupid mood. But thank you so much for doing this, Ian. I'm, you know, it's an absolute honor for me to talk to you. I've been a lifelong fan of your work and Deep Purple and all that. So thank you for doing this. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And I think, you know, I was telling someone one of the, you know, best things that happened in the pandemic was that we got a new Deep Purple album. So uh, uh -huh. I absolutely love the album. <clears throat> I've been listening to it nonstop. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how the album came together? Um, as usual, there was no plan. We just had a gap in our recording schedule and our touring schedule and so decided yeah, well, let's get together and see what happens. And of course, we have Bob Ezrin now as a producer for the last yeah. few albums. Mm -hmm. He's very encouraging. And um, uh, so that's it. We went to our usual rehearsal place in Germany for 10 days and mm -hmm. come up with some ideas and um, mm -hmm. just proceeded from there. We went to Nashville and uh, had another writing session then. Bob joined us for the arranging session mm -hmm. and uh, then we went straight to the recording studio and um, it was a natural process. I mean, these guys are so prolific when it comes to ideas and they've worked together for so long Yeah, that um, one great thing is the producer. Now we have a producer because for all of our lives, Deep Purple being a very democratic group with no leader, mm -hmm. we have um, always kind of shown too much respect for each other when it comes to arrangements, because one guy will say, oh, well, we need a bridge here, or we need to make a transition here, or we need a solo here. Mm -hmm. And everyone else will be going, 
not really a good idea, but let's try it anyway. Whereas Bob Ezrin would just say, no, don't like it, move on. So we saved days and days and days of um, um, speculation and mild disagreements in the, in the studio. And it, it, it means it gives added pace to the whole process. And so there's a sense of um, immediacy about the whole thing, which I like. Mm -hmm. So it came about um, musically, just as everything else does, but lyrically, as always, it's really relevant to the moment in time. Um, okay. Every album we've done has been an encapsulation of what's going on at that moment, um, which will reflect in the lyrics normally, in, yeah. to some degree or another. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of conversation about current affairs on this one in the studio when before the lyrics got started, and I made a lot of notes about that. Mm -hmm. But do you think um, is that is that something you believe, Ian? That songwriting needs to be more provocative today, more challenging, almost like the fifties and sixties, where it made people kind of get involved. Uh, do you think we lack that today? I personally don't know. I, I'm very selfish when it comes to my idea of what songwriting should be. It's basically what's going through my head at the time. Mm -hmm. Naturally enough, through human chemistry, that's going to reflect what's going on around me. So there's an, a natural embrace anyway, I think, with uh, current affairs or, and it depends how much notice you take of those things. Yeah. Generally, we find we become disconnected as we get older, as new generations take over our culture and our social behavior. But um, I think as musicians, you stay in touch perhaps a little more um, than you would if you were working in a, in a, in a field or something like that. Um, just basically because it's in your face every day uh, because of the media involvement you have and that sort Correct. of thing. And, and because you're working with a group of people, you know, that uh, it's not just the band, it's the conversations that go on that are fairly, I mean, they're fairly stimulating, I think. Interestingly enough, Deep Purple, it's, I mean, if you can have five different points of view, then Deep Purple has that. They are, they are really interesting characters and so they lean this way and that way as far as political affiliations are concerned and cultural, I don't know, attitudes. So it's always fairly vibrant, but we never get into an argument. It's just a, a, a stimulating discussion. I don't feel a sense of responsibility at all. Um, any more than I feel we owe it to the fans or any of those other cliches that mm -hmm. are th <laughs> thrown at you to give you a guilt complex. Yeah. Um, I, I think really you have to satisfy yourself first of all um, because fashions come and fashions go and if you Correct. try to be fashionable, by definition, you're, tomorrow you'll be unfashionable. So Correct. Yeah. in order to survive, you need to be true to yourself, I think. And it's, I know that's another cliche, but... It serves you well uh, throughout life. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, um, we're all fascinated with what goes on, but um, the, you know, if, it, if it's not very exciting politically yeah. or culturally, then we'll, then we'll start writing stories about what happened in the old days. <laughs> <laughs> because it's something I've always wondered, right? That music can serve as sort of a voice to all of these protests and things that go on, like you said, culturally. So. I've always mm. wondered whether musicians feel a certain, is there a sense of responsibility that, you know, songwriting needs to be more challenging? I think, I think there is, but not for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't feel that, I don't feel that at all. Um, mm -hmm. If I did, then I'd be compromising what I thought. Yeah. Um, if I thought I was trying to please people or True. satisfy a certain politically popular point or culturally popular point of view, mm -hmm. it would, it would alter what I was writing, and I, yeah. it would become anodyne, sugar-coated, and uh, there to please, and therefore meaningless. So I, I've tried to avoid that sense of responsibility and just okay. bring out the inner us, if you like. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Coming coming back to the uh, album, Ian, uh, this is that one song that I'd like to talk about. It's uh, a song that was on the first track of the first Deep Purple album, and the address. Um, why did you pick that song uh, to remake? Is it like uh, like I read somewhere someone said, is this the you know rounding off of Deep Purple as it were? 
<laughs> that's very interesting. It wasn't our idea at all. It was Bob's idea to mm-hmm. just do that. And you're you're not far off the truth. But he's, he didn't say, this is the last album. He said, if this is the last album. And, of course, he thought there was a nice twist because we've always done little covers here and there, songs at the end of an album, a little fun track that we'd always use as a bonus track or throw or stuff. Mm-hmm. just while we're having fun in the studio. So I think um, And The Address was the first Deep Purple song that was recorded, I believe. Yep. And uh, so he said, well, why not make it the last one as well? So, But it's not going to be the last one because there's more to come. <laughs> Fantastic. I was hoping that because, I mean, I guess you can't go out on the road. So hopefully maybe you're back in the studio writing more stuff. Well, there's lots of things been going on in the past. Some of it I can't talk about um, mm-hmm. quite yet, but I'll be happy to get back to you when anything happens. <laughs> um, I love we're it. back on the, we're back on the road next February. We, you know, the large venues are just hopeless to uh, expect any promoter to take those risks or those losses. And um, you know, working with a 25 percent or 40 percent capacity is just not feasible for promoters. It, it's a Let's not forget, it's the commercial business as well. So they have Absolutely. to at least break even. And they take enough risks anyway. I dedicated my autobiography to promoters mm-hmm. because they're in the front line all the time. And they're the ones that give us the work and take the risks and come up with the ideas and bring the people in. So, um, yeah, we have to wait until next February. And then next year, it'll be pretty chock a block. Mm-hmm. And we're already planning for the year after and hopefully come wow. into your neck of the woods. In oh, 23. Fabulous. Fabulous. I was just going to ask. But what excited me most was I saw Deep Purple is back at Hellfest. And I, I do a lot of photography and I build content for bands as well. So I've been shooting mm. at Hellfest the last few years. And I was really excited when I saw uh, your name there for next year. Okay, cool. Well, we'll see you there then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I can't wait. Uh, coming back to um, the album, um, Ian, when you pick a particular song... Uh, how much creative liberty can you take with changing the original in the case of a cover, like say, and the address, and you've covered, uh, you know, in your own solo body of work, you've, you've covered got, lots of songs. It's like anything. When you do a cover, even of your own stuff, yeah. you've got to treat it with respect. There's no point taking a classic song or even a, a little known song and trying to change it mm-hmm. apart from your, into your natural style. And as and the address is our natural style anyway, there's very little. It's just a riff with a couple of solos, to be honest. It's, it's an instrumental, and uh, it's just how things were in those days. People got excited about a riff, and you would develop that and just play it. Um, we did a lot of stuff like that on stage, and we still do. Mm-hmm. And it's just a natural expression of joy of music, and people say, oh, well, all kinds of criticism for doing... Um, well, it's not really a song. It's in a, what are they doing? Instrument? Who do they think they are? And all this sort of thing. <laughs> but nowadays, um, it's different. I think you have to show respect for the original. Um, but it doesn't mean to say you can't put your own stamp on it, your own um, uh, characteristics. If it's someone else's song, for example, we've done loads of those, and so have I over the years. And you always stay... You want to keep the character of the song. Otherwise, why would you do it? You know, change something fantastic, something not so fantastic, because it's your idea of making it better, which it never is. So people in, people have in their minds the original song, if they've uh, assuming they've heard it. And so I think um, you can't destroy that illusion. You've just got to complement it, I think. That's the approach to to covers. Yeah, because when I was talking to Don McLean, I asked him, you know, he was telling me that he plays American Pie the same way every single time he plays it, just out of respect to the original. And, you know, every time there's possibly a new audience, and that's what people come to hear. So I've always wondered whether you tweak it to suit a modern context um, or do you just stay true to the original? I don't think we do that consciously, but obviously it happens. I'll tell you an interesting story about a difference. You know, a lot of people think you just get up and do the same thing every night. Well, we don't because it's a challenge. And because of the way we are and a lot of other bands, um, we like to be expressive. And you're reading from the same game sheet every night. But you've got to make it interesting because a lot of the audience have been to see you many times. 
Yeah. So I was working with well, I was working with Pavarotti a couple of times. I sang Lesson Dorma with him, and mm-hmm. we were having a glass of wine and after, after a rehearsal. And he said, Ian, I'm so jealous of you. I am so je-. he wanted to be a pop star, by the way, Pavarotti. Wow. He wanted to be he wanted to be a rock star. We talked about making an album together, but it never happened. It was too late in his life. But he said, I'm so jealous of you. I've heard you sing Smoke on the Water six times, and every time it's different. Sometimes you're driving it on, sometimes you're laid back, sometimes you yeah, you, sometimes you accentuate the chorus, and sometimes you draw us right into the events of the verse. He said, and it's the same with the band. He said, with my music, with my any one of my popular arias, I have to be exactly the same as my first interpretation technically and emotionally it has to be absolutely the same and it bores me to death so i i'm jealous of your freedom with the music so with covers or with our own music that's repeated on stage every night it's always different and because of the um improvisation that goes on on stage i'm scared i'm not scared i'm used to it now but i have to set myself up to face the challenge of what the heck is going to go on tonight because it's always different there are key phrases and key riffs and key rhythms and key structures uh, that we know and that will be signals for a change. But what goes on in between with the interchange with the yeah. instrumentalist is, is who knows? It's just what comes out of their crazy minds. Amazing. What's the what's the story with the name of the album? Is there a backstory there? Um, what's it called? <laughs> <laughs> Whoosh. Oh, of course, whoosh. <laughs> well, whoosh is a one word that appears in the song, in, in, in one song on the album. And uh, it's basically encapsulating the idea that humanity has come and will become here and gone in the blink gone, of an yeah. eye. So it's like whoosh. I think... Uh, that summed it all up because there's quite a lot of um, quite a lot of thinking about the in this kind of um, way about the power of the moon and the the fragility of humanity and all of those kind of topics that were interesting to us at the time of the making of the album. So, whoosh means um, a transitory moment on Earth for humanity. Yeah, it's just it's tongue in cheek, you know. It's everything is meant to be provocative and make you think, but it's not meant to preach. It's it's just a it's just a device. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is it uh, you know you spoke about working with Bob Ezrin? Um, is it fair to say that you know three albums ago, Deep Purple had kind of hit a creative rut, and Ezrin helped um, you guys get to where you are today? I think so, yes. That would be an accurate thing to say. Mm-hmm. It's happened two or three times in our lives when you you suddenly find there's something not quite there pulling the trigger to get you going as you were before. And a lot of those things are simply age, uh, the process of growing up. And that's a hard thing because you mustn't be ashamed of it because maturing is a good thing and it gives you a broader perspective on life. And on, on your youth as well, and on your, it can challenge your previous opinions, which I think is quite natural. There's also um, other elements to that, and I think we struggled, quite honestly, with the lack of a producer over our entire career, because when you work in a in a, a, a debate circle on which way you're going to go, it naturally takes a bit of the edge off it, uh, off of the, the the cutting edge. Mm-hmm. And so Bob was very much about doing things fast and getting things on, plus the added bonus of he got the best sound we've ever had. That that was always been one of my little quiet niggles in the back of my mind is that Deep Purple could have always sounded better on record. And um, so he fixed that. And I've been delighted with the sound we've got since Bob joined us. Mm-hmm. The other element, of course, is that because Bob is a maestro in the sense of um, his musical ability. I mean, he's a concert pianist. He records orchestras, everything from Alice Cooper to the London Symphony Orchestra. And, so, and you know, he's worked on 
his, his CV is impeccable. Yep. Plus, he's a master of the, uh, the technical side of things in the studio. I mean, he's still teaching kids who are coming in as engineers who think they know it all digitally and uh, whatever, and he suddenly brings in this awareness of the sound itself, that it's not all about what's on your monitor. It's all about what's in your ears and what yeah, the musicians yeah. are playing. So, yeah, he's very important. Plus, he's an all-around good guy, and he's about the same age as us, and he's the only one uh, to command respect uh, when it says, okay, we're doing it this way. <laughs> so, so, basically, that's all it was, that you just went back to doing things the way you were doing them in the 70s? Was that like a I think switch so. that Bob flipped? It's that's an easy way of putting it, but in in essence, yes, you're right. Um, it, you know, we all lose track from time to time, basically because we're reliant upon our environment, and that means the people around us and the circumstances around us. But they change, mm -hmm. and they leave us they leave us naked of uh, the all the cushions and comfort and support that we had in our younger years. And all of a sudden you're walking alone and you, you're you out of phase with culture, you're out of phase with fashion because there's that new age coming in and everything has changed. And it's not only technically, but musically and inspirationally and historically, they're looking to different sources. And um, so you need, it doesn't mean to say you've weakened in any technical sense or mm -hmm. spiritual sense, but your surroundings have changed. And one of the most important things that I think that is important, whether you're a football team or a musical group, is the human chemistry uh, and understanding between each other that you you can overcome these um, adversarial conditions or you adapt. Now, that's a dangerous thing. If you adapt slightly, you have to technically because there's no avoiding it. Absolutely. But if you adapt, you just have to dig deeper, I think. And Bob helped us do that and rediscover stuff. Um, and not be afraid, because sometimes to speak as an older person in a young world uh, is quite um, uh, challenging. Yeah, I can imagine. But you, you touched upon something very interesting there. You said, uh, you know, you spoke about Bob talking to young engineers about it's not what's just on your monitor. And, you know, if you look at the greatest albums of all time, there's always been an element of human error in the albums, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, so in an era where there's a tendency to overproduce things, uh, we've reached a point, I think, where everything can be pitch, shift, pitch shifted to be perfect. There's, you know, auto-tune and Melodyne and stuff like that. You know, how do you prevent that from happening? Well, you just don't allow it. We pref Here's the process that hasn't changed. This is what Bob insisted on. And what, mm -hmm. in fact, it didn't take much persuasion because that's how we do it. When we get together, we write together. <clears throat> no one ever has brought a song into a Deep Purple writing session and said, here's a song. Um, it all comes from a spark uh, and a jam session. Mm -hmm. I tell you, the guys come in every day at noon and we have a cup of tea and drift into the rehearsal room. No preset order. It might be the drummer, it might be the banjo player, it might be the bass player, it might be me. And um, they start playing and they jam until three o'clock break for tea, carry on again till six o'clock. And during that time, everything's being recorded. Roger Glover is our main sort of monitor. And by the time we get to Wednesday, so, you know, two o'clock uh, Monday afternoon, that was a pretty good little idea that came out. So let's have a listen to that. And so we develop these ideas that have come out and go, yeah, that could be a song, that could be a piece of work, that could be a piece of music. And so it gradually evolves and like a snowball, it builds up. And gradually the the nuances are added and we begin to understand the song and this is before any lyrics or tune uh, it has to be a decent piece of music first before we i've torn up so many sets of lyrics when the guys have said no we don't like this after all <laughs> a few days after it's written <laughs> so that's okay i'm very happy with that so i think it's a a a, 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 a process that is just natural and you know, lyrically, another th little tiny thing that Bob has done that's made it such a difference in my life mm -hmm. is insisting, in insisting on the fact that the songs are in the right key for the singer. Because 
you know, the banjo player will go, you know, that's good in G, well, that's good in whatever it might be. And, you know, the fingers will go, yeah, well, that's good for me because the black notes are all in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, by the time it's developed, I've got, oh, my God, you know, I, I, I'm expected to sing this in, you know, the key of uh, ozone. So um, it's, it's, so I'm going to have to do something different. The natural melody cannot be found in that key. So I'm going to have to sing something harmonic and base it around there, which is always second best. So um, I think Bob's, you know, got a keen ear for that kind of thing at an early stage. And that's made a big difference to me. Yeah, yeah. Because when I was talking to uh, Steve Lukather, he was saying that, you know, there's just so many people out there that don't know how to play that can technically make music, but none of it really sounds musical. And well, um, our stuff, sorry to interrupt, but I didn't quite finish what happened. But the, yeah. then the whole band learns the arrangement. We finish the lyrics. We play it together. We practice it and rehearse it up to a point. And then we record it. And when we record it, everyone is in the studio at the same time, just like it was in 69. Fantastic. Everyone together. And Bob's in the control room and I'm singing and everyone is... Of course, there are mistakes. There are bits that we think, ah, oh, all right, that could be better. Or we change the lyric here. And that's repaired afterwards. Of course, we can do that. And that's recording technique. That's behind the scenes. That's what people don't want to know about. They don't want to spoil the illusion. that. Um, but it's pre and, and then we do it on stage, live. And it's just us. So that idea now of filling the spectrum with every piece of kitchenware that you can find to make a record is you you will not find a breathing room one of the great things about analog recordings because you are limited to the number of tracks you record at one time 24 uh onto a two inch tape it meant that um you you, you had to you could only devote um four tracks to the drums unless you unless you submix and so all of these things were very human you could hear the squeak of a hi-hat pedal. You could hear the intake yeah. of breath. You could hear the odd scratch of a plectrum on a street. You could hear the odd, and um, in the music, you, you could hear the room, you could feel the room. You'd listen to even the super advanced um, producers and technology of the time with the Beach Boys, for example, and with the Beatles, you could still hear the humanity in it. Yeah, and exactly. that's why dynamics and emotion and it draws you in because you feel as if you're there with them whereas now it's a wall of sound on what even on acoustic records it's a wall of sound where no fault can be found correct correct i think that's what made the old records it's the imperfections that made it so interesting and very moving right exactly nobody noticed it at the time but i mean we just that's how it was yeah. So we we loved it. I mean, I'm just I'm just I'm thinking now, of little Richard singing Jenny Jenny Jenny, and he's on his knees sucking breath from behind his calf muscles just to get these notes out and falling on the floor. It's so exciting that yeah. he's at the absolute limit of his powers, and uh, yeah. it's still wonderful. You don't get that now. You don't get any. Um, I think it's important that you you could show some without necessarily being beaten by it but to show some vulnerability is an attractive mm -hmm. trait yeah in, in even in normal life you know if you're if you're impervious to anything then you're not really an attractive proposition to talk with <laughs> over dinner but if you if you have strengths and weaknesses then we can find a way yeah absolutely but uh were there any moments like that when you guys recorded smoke on the water were there imperfections that you know that you know exist to this day but people don't catch it um that's the most unbelievable story because we had very limited time after the fire in montreux burnt down the casino where we were due to record we got thrown out of another place and then we ended up in the grand hotel as it says in the lyrics and um we had i think three days to finish the album and the day before that martin birch our engineer said guys we're seven minutes short of an album. We we just haven't got enough. The, the songs aren't long enough. And what are we going to do? And we've got to get out of here tomorrow, tomorrow night. So we retrieved the sound check from the first session. 
uh, from the warm-up session, just while we were getting the mattresses and the blankets and the microphones on the stairs and corridors all put in place. And uh, there was this jam and it was smoke on the water, just a bare riff. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, well, we can build something on that. Let's make a song of that. So we decided to write the biographical story of the making of the album Machine Head. We all came out to Montreux in the late June. And so it goes through that story. And it was rough as anything. And it ended up being a seven minute filler track. Wow. To, that's what we thought of it. And it wasn't, it never got played on the radio. And uh, radio was big in those days and very important. Uh, but a guy called Russ Shaw, who worked for Warner Brothers, came to see us performing at a show in L.A. and saw the reaction to the crowd with Smoke on the Water. And he went he went back and looked at the album, seven minutes. My God, that's never going to get played. So um, he did an edit to three minutes, 15 seconds. And it was out, re-released as a single the next day. And as it, it just got played around the world. So, and it... I listened to the performance on that and I go, my God, that was just a scratch song. That was it was awful. Incredible. But, it, but technically awful. That's but that doesn't matter. You know, my tone of voice, I've never been happy with that on that record. Wow. Um, and I listened to I listened to the thing, but it's so exciting. And uh that 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 was for me the the value of spontaneity and working in an emergency. I think if we hadn't been professionals and together for a couple of albums already, um, it would have been too much for us. But uh, there was a, a work ethic within the band that made it happen. So, yeah, great fun. That happened a lot in those days. And it still does. Bob lets things go. I'm listening to stuff on recent recordings um, that I'm thinking, ooh, <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Bob goes, no, it's fine. It's fine. That's that's amazing, right? Because there's always a tendency to fix it. I mean, you can fix it now. Any imperfection, like you said, can be fixed. Whether it's a yeah, it's the key or whatever it is, anything can be fixed. But um, why do you think you know the songs that you wrote back then have a certain timelessness to it, Ian? Today, there's so many bands that come and go, songs that come and go. Why do you think these songs had a timeless quality? It still gets played. I mean, young people still listen to Smoke on the Water and Highway Star and all of that. Yeah. I've thought about this quite a lot, and I don't really know the answer, except that we were there first. I think there's only so much you can do in that mm -hmm. genre. Um, and it's rather like the American postcode, which is one, zero, one, or the prime meridian, which is um, runs through Greenwich, because that's where they started first. And that's where they got logged in everyone's mind and things were built around them. Mm -hmm. With music like that, um, our stuff, we progressed very quickly. We were the first generation to absorb American blues. It was huge in England. Um, we were listening to, and rhythm and blues. We were listening to, um, you know, um, Howling Wolf and uh, Chuck Berry and all that lot in, in England on imported records and learning their songs because they were easy. They only had three chords. And so, and the lyrics were teenage stuff. And so we could relate to it. And there were bands on every street corner playing Chuck Berry and and uh, you know, Howling Wolf and stuff like that, and Little Walter picking up harmonicas and playing guitars, acoustic guitars that only had four strings on them because they couldn't afford to fill. It was so joyful. And of course the energy just um, built up and up and up and we re-exported the English version of blues and rhythm and blues back to America because it was a very small niche market in America. Mm -hmm. Blues, and they, had, they had black radio stations that would only play blues and uh, that, was, that was all there was to it. And so the, um, there was this huge, like big bang, if you like, of music that happened in England at the time. And the energy was enormous. And some people absorbed Tamla Motown and other people absorbed you know, all kinds of music, Indian music, that was uh, hugely important in our in our development. And it all went out, bang, 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 the creation of the universe. It was just one of those things. And so now what's to do? You know, how, how can you, you can't copy it. You can't recreate it. You can't do another version of Highway Star or another version of uh, Wouldn't It Be Nice 
or another version of, um, you know, Helter Skelter. You can't do that yeah. because it's a pale imitation. So you have to constantly create something new. There are now um, an exponentially greater number of musicians in the world than there were in my time. Everyone is in a band. Every one of my daughter's friends is in a band. Every one of my friend's friends are in a band, whether in Portugal or in England or in Germany or in other places. And of course, they're searching for inspiration. And I try to help in the fact that say, well, if you really want inspiration, if you want to be a rock band, don't look at Deep Purple and Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin because you know, we've run dry of inspiration for you. Mm -hmm. Look at the things that inspired us. And in the inspiration for Deep Purple, because of the musicians and the human chemistry, you will find Chopin, Beethoven, Buddy Rich, Elvis Presley, Bob Dylan. I mean, it's endless folk music of all kinds. And these are the things that the individuals brought into the group. So there's a hugely disparate um, palette, if you like, to build from. Mm -hmm. Now, if you just copy then what we did and link it with Sabbath and Zeppelin, it's going to be much more limited because those earlier things were interpreted through the eyes and the ears and heart and soul of the individual musicians brought sure. together in a band. So um, go anywhere for inspiration. I, the, one of the things I hate most about manky wokery at the moment is their um, insistence that we are... Um, you having a, a cultural appropriation, misappropriation of culture. In other words, you can't wear a sombrero if you come back from holiday in Mexico. It's such a load of nonsense. So yeah. where, would, Chopin, would Chopin die without anyone having been inspired by him or Beethoven or Mozart or Bob Dylan or any of these things that become so, so much part of our human wealth? It's just so stupid. Mm -hmm. So I'm... I'm I, I can't be bothered with all of that. We, 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 we are inspired by what went before, no matter where it came from. So I think now if kids are looking for inspiration, they should search further back. It doesn't mean to say they can't use their talent and skills to, for their own voice, but in the early days, in your formative years, you have to learn the craft before yeah. you can use, use the art. So you've got to learn the craft of singing and you, or playing and you develop a style by copying your heroes or copying someone who's really good. So if you want to be a guitar player, don't copy Tony Iommi, copy his hero, Django Reinhardt. You know, if you want to, it, it's, it's not difficult, but people are fixated. And I think they're beginning to do that. If you want yeah. to learn to sing, listen to Ella Fitzgerald or Elvis Presley or Little Richard or, you know, Nat King Cole, it doesn't matter, just, just, embrace all these things to develop your skills and then you'll find your own voice with yeah. an instrument or your natural voice and you can go further and there's so much hope and encouragement and so much talent around but i think these songs will never be replaced because they are of an era mm -hmm. and it's you know you can't reinvent the first jet engine or the first yeah, train or the true, first true. Any of these things, you know, you can make a better one, but in the end, people get fed up. It's just a thing on wheels, you know. Yeah, yeah, true. But tell me, Ian, uh, do you listen to the music of today? Do, uh, where do you look for inspiration? What inspires Ian Gillen to continue? Um, I, 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 don't, I don't listen to much uh, of what's going on today. And the reason for that is very simple, because when I made recorded Speed King with Deep Purple on Deep Purple in Rock, one of my heroes was my uncle Ivor, who was a jazz pianist. I absolutely adored him and idolized him. His music was so exciting. I don't know if you ever saw the propaganda movie Reefer Madness, which was um, no, uh, propaganda against, against smoking marijuana. Okay. And uh, all the kids looked at this movie because this guy, he was playing sedately for one minute and the next minute he obviously been off and smoked a dodgy cigarette somewhere. And he came back, his hair was all over the place and he was playing this crazy boogie woogie. And everyone went, wow, we got to do that because he sounds fantastic. <laughs> and my uncle Ivan, I'm sure he never even heard of marijuana, but he was so into his jazz and his stride and boogie woogie. And I loved it. Mm -hmm. So when I made uh, Speak King with Deep Purple, my, my first, one of the first recordings we made, um, I, I took it back to our flat and said, Uncle Ivor, come and listen to this. This is my first recording with Deep Purple. 
So I cranked it up loud and put on speaking. And he ran from the room screaming with his hands over his ears, saying, ah, I can't hear anything. Which, of course, he had to reattune his mind because he couldn't hear or distinguish uh -huh. the instrument. And he was from a different age, a gentler age, even though he was wild in his own mind. And I realized then that in, in a way, I had a kind of satisfaction from that. Mm -hmm. And that was because I was creating my own music in my own age. And this happens not just with music, but there's a kind of psychological vandalism that all adolescents, all teenagers have, that they want to get rid of what their fathers did and make their own ground. And they can't stand the comparison with what their fathers did because it normally pales by comparison. <laughs> so they get rid of it. So they can't be criticized. Oh, this is all new, this is fresh and it's me. And that's what I felt. And I think every generation feels that. And so there's no point. There was no point in, um, in, in, in listening to it for the same, because I remember that story. I, don't, I believe that all forms of contemporary music can only be judged subjectively. Mm -hmm. You can't find an objective uh, judgment for it until it's been there and becomes classical. So after mm -hmm. a quarter, 25 years or something like that, so no, I don't listen to a lot. I listen, I listen to it through the ears of my daughter um, and I, I keep up with a lot of local bands and that sort of thing, but I don't listen to uh, hip hop. Um, and I've watched its development from a raw street music into a sophisticated uh, yeah. commercial style, um, betraying every principle that they had from the beginning. But let's not worry about that because it's normal. And once business embraces you, you there is no escape. Correct. So, um, I, you know, once you say, oops, my eyes fell off my bar. Uh -huh. I've done that before. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, so, yeah, I don't listen to current music no because there's no point i can't criticize it with any sense of subjectivity I, my, my it's all objective mm -hmm. so um, i enjoy it and i enjoy people seeing having a good time and i listen to it in public it sounds great if i listen to it in a bar or in a fairground or in a marketplace uh where music is or on a beach um you know it sounds great and makes people happy so that's that's good enough for me so, so when you do these big festivals, like you were at Hellfest a couple of years ago, right? Do you, uh, do you hang out backstage and listen to the other bands or you're just done with your thing and then you're off stage? Well, it, 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 <laughs> if you could see the schedules of where we come from the day before, uh, it's a bit crazy, and where we're yeah. going the day after, <laughs> you'd realize it was very limited time. Our crew, yeah, that's true. in fact, we even have two sets of equipment and, and we, have, we, we do the leapfrogging. From uh, we have a rig and a b rig that leapfrogs the so we can make these shows on such an intense yeah. schedule. If that very often, very often there are bands that we know and musicians that we know, and they're sure if the schedule allows, if they're on one before us, we can get to hear them. Um, we generally prefer <clears throat> on these festivals to do the spot before the end, not the closing spot, because. I think they like to have a bit of rock and roll or blues. Yeah. And people start thinking about going home towards the end. And the energy after a long day peaks, I think, at around 7 or 8 o'clock in the evening. Um, yeah. I, from experience, people are drunk and tired and fed up and wanting to go home. And if, the, if it's raining, it's even worse. So, And it often is. So, yeah. I think uh, the 7 o'clock or 7 till 9 o'clock spot is good, depending on what time they finish. Mm -hmm. And yes, we do get to see lots of friends and catch up. They come to our dressing room or, you know, we'll go to theirs and or hang out in the corridors or backstage. If there's a, a kind of a, a canteen there, we'll, we'll hang out there. But I, yeah. I, it's great to meet up with old friends, but it's so rare uh, to actually have the chance to socialize. Yeah. Do you have any fun memories of playing in India? I think you've been here a few times, right? You were here in... 2013 yeah. and 2002. I I have, I always laugh when I, people ask that question and n n not many people have, but uh, I I have such fantastic memories of India. Uh -huh. oh, one is uh, the number of beautiful antiques that I bought when I was there that are uh, in my house in England now. That I just I it's it's a it's a conflict with one of the most peaceful, beautiful experiences I ever had. I'd never experienced anything like Indian culture or Indian um, social uh, behavior, and the, the beauty and the calm of it all. I'm not just 
winding you up now. I, I, it was profound. Um, and in early days, of course, uh, we did interact with cultures that were so different. And it's so important to learn from those. When I go back to England, I see my country in a different light altogether and value all the contributions that everyone's... We're a mongrel nation, you know, and uh, we've got so many... Uh, people from all over the world have settled there and interacted. And I, I can't understand what all the fuss is about at the moment about this minority thing, because mm -hmm. from where I stand overseas, I see England as a country full of lovely, um, charitable people. They raise so much money for charity and, and friendly and welcoming. And it's only the activists and the malcontents, I think, they, mm -hmm. of course, some important issues. But the people who politically act, who bring in issues from one point here and one point in the world here where there's been an injustice and make it a mainstream um, policy in, in England, I don't see it that way at all. Um, but India was uh, profound for me. And apart from the uh, wonderful time I had there and the food and the people, mm -hmm. the most, the, the thing I remember most is a, a I, th I think it was a cricket ground we were playing in, uh, or a festival ground, and the all the stage and the light and sound desks and the partition had been handmade with bamboo and twine, and there was it was magnificent. The craftsmanship was amazing, wow. and there was in front of this it was many tens of thousands of people were there, and instead of all this work, instead of crash barriers at the front. They had four policemen with a piece of string <laughs> that was unbroken throughout the whole show. Wow. They, they held the crowd just by being there. And there were a couple of kids that got tangled up with a string around their neck, but it was just a joy to behold. And uh, the other thing was the lighting towers at each side of the sound and light desk. Mm -hmm. There were two huge towers on top of which they put some old super troopers, the kind of things that you'd see for anti-aircraft uh, searchlights or in Hollywood yeah. to, to light up the sky, massively powerful things that were gas powered to start with. You had to ignite them to start with. And then this huge beam warmed up and became sensational. Well, they'd been up there for a little while and they didn't know that a vulture had nested in one of the towers or decided to make it home. And so they fired up this thing, which made a big boom. And the vulture went whack and came out of the tower and landed quite heavily on the ground. And I think was probably a bit stunned or disturbed. But you know how people are in Indian with creatures. And so the creature was walking around amongst the crew and everything else all day and all afternoon during the sound check. During which time I had a little slight touch of deli belly. And I was a little oh, bit um, uh, nervous because the toilets were at the other end of the field. And they hadn't thought of that. And of course, normally that wouldn't be a problem. But uh, on my occasion, I said, well, we better arrange something temporary backstage for me, if you don't mind. So they made a little cave of, um, you know, um, flight cases and screen, and, uh, and they put a, a bucket in there for me. And <laughs> wow. needless to say, after the second song, I felt the need. And so I said, solo guys, long solo. <laughs> so I dashed back off the stage, went into my little cave and I sat down on the, on the bucket and I, I sensed something next to me and I, it was all dark. And there was the vulture sitting next to me, <laughs> looking equally uncomfortable. So <laughs> it's a priceless memory that, I, that has always been there. And normally it's not a story that interests anyone, but as you asked. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. I love it. Uh yeah, this was in 95 or 2013? No, we haven't been there in 2013, have we? I thought you guys were here in 2000. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe 2002, oh, okay. actually. Time flies. Time flies. I can't remember. I've got a schedule of uh, a, a Deep Purple concerts since, and my concerts and Sabbath concerts and everything I've ever done since 1962. But... Needless to say, I can't remember it, and it needs a bit of tidying up. So, um, I, I, I will take your, I'll take your word for it. It seems like a long time ago, yeah, maybe, maybe 2002, about 18, 19 years ago. I must, 
it, it must have been early days for Steve Morse. And Steve Morse has been with us for about 25 years. So it's maybe, in the last yeah, 25 maybe, years. Yeah, maybe 95 when you guys were here. I think you were here in 95, right? Let's yeah, put that, that on about, YouTube. That sounds about right. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think must have been 95. I want to ask you, uh, last couple of questions, Ian. There was a, the, that concert where you guys got into the Guinness Book of Records. I think it was at the London Rainbow Theatre, right? So this, the story goes that three people were unconscious because of how loud it was. Was, was that true? Was it, was it really that loud? Um, I, yeah, probably, <laughs> you know, I, I think, I think the sound there was in those days, you know, the, the administrators of public life are still thinking in those terms because sound has become far more sophisticated. Now you don't get the piercing, damaging high frequencies that used to be there and you don't get the gut churning bass end that used to be there. It's all far more um uh, friendly now the sound even though it's powerful but yes we had new marshall pa he never made a pa before and so the the horns at the top were tannoy horns and they were excruciating like chainsaws um but yes i, I think there were some people that um, fell over <laughs> yeah i was reading it about it now, but, it, but they never measured anything else before and they'd never <laughs> measured anything much afterwards so it's all it's all just an excuse for a story, really. But yeah. it didn't do us any harm. It did, ha did no harm to us at all. Yeah, I was also reading, um, I read on Twitter yesterday that Tony Iommi had posted saying they were going to remaster the Born Again album. Yeah, I heard that. Well, that would be a joy. I, I wonder, they must have found the tapes then. <laughs> yeah, that, I think maybe that's what he found, tweeted. Or maybe they must have found the person who had the tapes all along. Yeah. That's what he tweeted. He said, we found the tapes and we're going to remaster the... I think that's what he had said. Well, that would be wonderful. That would be sensational. There yeah. are a couple of tracks on that that I absolutely love. Um, my favorite track is um, uh, Trashed. Was there a Which... reference to Trashed on the current Deep Purple album on Woosh? Was there a line that referenced something from Trashed? I don't... If... I don't know. I can't remember. Two yeah. years since I, I don't know. Um, what, there, there, was, there, was an, there was another album of yours that I was I really enjoyed. I think it was called Gillen's Inn, the one which oh, had Joseph, which anthology. had Ronnie James Dio. Anthology it had everyone in the world on it. Yeah. Yes, that was a joy to make, an absolute joy. Had, um, yeah, it was. It was. It was amazing. Were, were, you good, were you good friends with Ronnie? Yeah, close. We were close. We were very close. There was Ronnie Dio and Klaus Meiner mm -hmm. and myself. We were on a tour together. And, of course, as you probably know, Klaus and Ronnie are diminutive figures. Um, they're not very tall. And I'm, I'm sort of just over six foot. And so... We had a photograph taken together with me in the middle and the two little ones either side of me. And uh, it was hilarious. And we've got the picture pinned up in the dressing room and it was called the three fivers as opposed to the three tenors. It's, it's an English joke, but um, so yeah, very, and it was Ronnie who, uh, when I was buying some socks in Munich airport, we were on the same charter plane together and uh, Ronnie was opening for Deep Purple, I think. And I was in the in the shop going through. I thought, oh God, I've got to buy some socks. And they had packs of three three pairs of socks hanging on a rack. So I was just looking through them, seeing which one I want. And Ronnie's head appeared through the socks and said, Ah, he said, socks, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's we were sweet. great mate. We were lovely mates. We were good mates. Yeah. It's 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 so that anthology sad, yeah. that anthology was fantastic. I was honored by the people who turned up to play on it. It was just fantastic. Fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. But tell me, Ian, are you in touch with Richie at all? Is there, is there any chance or hope in hell of even Richie showing up one day on stage, maybe? No. We, uh, the answer to your question is yes, we are in touch. <coughs> Tensions eased quite a lot 
after um, we got hold of our business affairs and sorted everything out, there were previous managers from the past who had, you know, not done things exactly as you would like. We've, you know, I didn't get paid for 10 years when I was with Deep Purple in the, in the big years. And uh, oh goodness knows what happened to all that. And there was other, there were other tensions too. And uh, needless to say, um, it was all pretty nasty when we finished and Richie walked out. But um, it, it's much more, you know, we're too old for all that now. So I, we've both written some pleasant notes via our managers. I mean, I can't write to Richie or phone him because he doesn't have a telephone. He doesn't have a computer. He lives in wow. the world. He lives in the world of green sleeves. He lives in a medieval world and he has messages given to him and um, that sort of thing. But he sent some pleasant words to me and I've sent some pleasant words to him. There are still issues, uh, still bones of contention. I've seen some, a lot of rubbish being spoken. It's not worth even rising to the occasion, but I hear David Coverdale and others talking about what happened at the Ro Hall of Fame, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah issue well it's it's all complete we were very kind to everybody uh, the current band and uh, we did invite Richie to play smoke on the water with us at the ceremony but he declined and uh, so I think all of those are just opportunistic remarks from the others we've never had any antagonism towards Richie I, he, he has his own interpretations and the rest of us have our interpretations so it's not really not worth being fired up about it. But I think probably this late in our career and um, with things being moving along so pleasantly for the band, it would naturally enough, uh, we discussed this years and years ago when it was mm -hmm. first talked about, it would be a circus. It would be a, a, a circus and take away. Um, a, a, it would be a distraction to everything we're doing, to be honest. And it would it would be... Um, no fun at all because we don't work that way anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think he's putting out music. I think Richie and his wife have been putting out music. I, I heard something a couple of weeks ago. Yes, they've been they've been quite active over the years. And um yeah, he has his own his own um style now, his own medieval um yeah. way of doing things. <laughs> have you been Bless watching it. a lot of cricket and football, Ian? Of course I have. Yes. Mm -hmm. The football, I tended, I fell out of love with football through all that childish behavior and cheating and falling over and the VAR and the, uh, yeah. the, the change of rules and the game being destroyed through not even being able to touch shoulders on a physical challenge and all of those things that probably have improved the game. I don't know, but um, I've been watching the European game. I'm not mm -hmm. particularly thrilled with the England side. I think the side is reflecting the personality of its manager, which is safe and sure. And I don't know, we've got some great players, I think, and we might progress. And if we do, hopefully they will become more expressive and a little more exciting. But we've got a manager who's, who thinks defence first. And fair enough, we've got clean sheets all the time so far. I've been watching the India. I watched the uh, test match in the one day series in India. Yeah. Fascinating. You guys are amazing, absolutely incredible. And uh, I've been just watched the, um, yeah, there's a lot of T20 stuff going on, one yeah. day stuff going on at the moment with the women's cricket too. And uh, there's England playing India at the moment in England. Yeah. And uh, that, that's that's pretty exciting. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of sports, and um, but I'm not um, obsessed by it. I, I fell out of love with Formula One for many years because. It, you know, the definition of racing to me is that there should be some element of overtaking. And uh, in Formula One, <laughs> I couldn't, I didn't see anyone overtake for about five years, I think. But that's got exciting again now because Verstappen's coming in to challenge Hamilton, who's yeah. in the twilight. Well, he's you no know, signs of him weakening yet, but Mercedes, I think, are having a bad year because they're developing for next year. Mm -hmm. So Formula One's a fascinating thing. Um, and there are some young drivers coming through with hope for the future. But I can't see Formula One existing in 10 years' time, though. Wow. Okay. But it's a great summer for sport in the UK, at least, right? With the Wimbledon and the cricket. And the, the, yeah, the Wimbledon Euro. just started. Are you, going, are you going back to England at any point? 
I'm going back in October. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm working here. I'm writing at the moment. I'm working on my book and uh, a lot of other bits and pieces. And I must admit, the sunshine is um, an attractive. The guaranteed sunshine, I should say, is is, is attractive. And uh, I'm waiting for a spare part for my boat, and then I can get out and uh, do a bit of poodling around when the temperature gets up to forty. I like to go out on the water and get some uh, get some breeze in my face. Um, wow. And my family, my family was going to come out next week um, to join me, but uh, we've got an illness in the family, and uh, mm-hmm. well, there's an awful there's a few travel difficulties with COVID at the moment. Um, yeah. Which I think we really so they're coming out at the end of August for three weeks, and um, but um, that's all right. They're used to me being away on tour and stuff, so and we speak every day. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I'm I'm happy here. Um, I'm happy in England. I'm happy anywhere I settle down. But all you need is a couple of home comforts to make life easy. And uh, the food here is sensational. Yeah, and not course, just the yeah. restaurant. The food you you buy in the shops. It's you buy the bread here. It's just plain and healthy, and it's not full of preservatives and <laughs> junk and other stuff. You know, my God, you walk into a, the local. Paulina's down the road in the little village there, and you, she's got a little fruit and vegetable section in her. It's like a family store. And it's the first time since I was a kid that I saw tomatoes that weren't all the same size. <laughs> <laughs> There's all these different, and they just as you pick them, you know, and not tailored for supermarket presentation. And so you think, well, yeah, and then you taste them and think, oh God, they're delicious. Yeah, I'm sure so, it tastes a whole lot better. Yeah, it does. Yeah, but you, you know, it's it's. Uh, we're lucky to have travelled so much and to be able to enjoy the experience of um, improving our lives by taking a little bit of input and cherry picking from different cultures and saying, "I like that. I think I'll do a bit of that." And uh, so, I'm. I got I got friends from Russia and from Germany or Austria and from South America coming to visit for a few days. So um, that means I have to stop writing for a few days. So, <laughs> And normally they talk so much, I, I think I've gone deaf when they leave. And uh, But it's, it's, it's nice to see old friends. Fabulous. Ian, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for your time. Pleasure. It's been a great pleasure. I enjoyed the interview. Nice talking to you. And Thank this is, I, I, was, I was a Zoom virgin until today. So <laughs> this is my first Zoom experience. That's it for this week's episode of Tales from the Road. Tales from the Road is brought to you by the Concert Photographer and Moving Pictures Media. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode. If you like what you heard, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify or Google Play. Thank you for listening.